Ya'at eshik eh arashitinne'e. Welcome to Neheje, Our Voices Indigenous Solutions podcast. We are now having the great pleasure of hearing from Naik. Naik Flores is a core member of dynamic community organizations that focus on Chamorro self-determination, environmental justice, and the protection of sacred sites, namely Putehi Li Texan, um, Save Retidian, and Independent Guahan. We are super honored to have you here, my dear friend. And um, maybe to start out, you could just share with us, you know, what battle are you and our Chamorro relatives in Guahan uh, fighting right now to protect the water of Guahan? Well, Hagu Mas, thank you more for the invitation to be here today. Um, I'm very honored and humbled to, to be here today and um, to share really the struggles that our indigenous community here is facing here at home. Um, you know, as you mentioned, uh, my homeland is Guahan, uh, also part of Lagos Zengani or the Marianas Ar Archipelago and um, our islands as well as, you know, several other islands in the, in the larger Micronesian region are heavily impacted by U.S. militarization and colonization. And um, right now in Guam, uh, we're, we are still reeling from generations of violence, desecration, environmental destruction um, that's impacted our ways of living, our language, our, our ways of healing. We really want to encourage our people to imagine, you know, a, an independent reality. Right now we're living a colonial reality every single day. And um, we have a lot of issues because of our colonial history and our colonial realities. We, you know, have really high rates of... Um, of sexual violence here, some of the highest in the nation, as well as among the highest rates of suicide. Among the incarcerated community here, majority are indigenous, as well as houseless, and those needing to depend on public programs, uh, mostly indigenous, if not indigenous tomorrow to this land, then indigenous Pacific Islander from other parts of Micronesia. And so addiction is a serious issue here. Um, as well. And all of these are, you know, symptoms of colonization. But the major issue that my community is, is dealing with now is this massive military buildup or military expansion, if you will, because the military has been here now for so long. And um, we have a long history of environmental racism here. We have, uh, gosh, um, 19 Superfund sites from the military here for such a small island, that's tremendous. Um, some of these super fun sites are actually located over our sole source aquifer that our island depends on for 80 to 90% of our fresh drinking water. We have over a hundred military toxic sites. Um, and uh, right after World War II, many families, including my own, lost our homeland, lost our ranch lands and our, and our, um, we lost our ranch lands, our farmlands. Uh, they were taken by eminent domain. You know, they were told we were told that they were taken for national security. And there's so much grief that comes with losing land. Um, that history being so recent, <laughs> when you look at the the risks involved with this military impact, and you measure it against this history of violence, colonial violence, it's really um, it's devastating. It's 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 colonization and militarization in action today. You know, we see it every day. It's it's in real time here on the island. And so in one um, of its most extreme forms. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And because, you know, of all this, we've had so, so much uh, heavy military contamination. Now we have several generations suffering from cancers and other illnesses for a long time. It was classified that we were exposed to nuclear radiation fallout from testing in the Marshall Islands. For a long time, it was classified and denied that Agent Orange was sprayed here. And, and now this has impacted many generations, PCBs, many, many contaminants. It was kept from the public for over a year. That there was a, a military jet fuel leak that uh, resulted in the, you know, the forced destruction of 500 tons of contaminated soil. You know, that's like several shipping containers worth of soil. This is, this is stuff that's going to impact us for several generations. And, and also during World War II, our island was, car we were carpet bombed and much of Micronesia wasn't. So we're also constantly finding unexploded ordnance um, 
you know, and, and all of this hazardous waste, all of this toxic waste, we didn't put it here. These came from the U.S. military. And so now we're engaged, you know, in a hyper-militarization and fighting against the hyper-militarization of our islands and the larger region because on top of all of that, they the military has cleared over 1,000 acres of limestone forest for the construction of a live fire training range complex and a marine base. And at this live fire training range complex, they want to fire um, close to 7 million ammunitions a year. And this is, you know, the thing is, is there are other firing ranges, military firing ranges that exist here. And this range is right over our aquifer again. 7 million ammunitions, propellants every single year. And that doesn't even include when other forces from the region, other, you know, or even local pol police or National Guard use that range. It's devastating to think about, you know, what it's meant for, like the destruction of native species, their traditional medicines that have been impacted. There's an eight spot butterfly that coexists in this beautiful biosyncretism with one of these mm. traditional medicines. And wow. they're both endangered and they both can't exist without the other. And they're both heavily wow. impacted by the, this construction slash destruction, really. Mm -hmm. And then not to mention that these are over ancestral villages, again, land that was taken from families, land that, uh, you know, many families dream of seeing the, you know, the return of one day. But it's also, we have we have to really get our folks around to this idea that we can get our land back, that we can be independent. We have to have our folks get to this place where we can imagine a better future for ourselves, right. other than this colonial reality that we've been inundated with. Because sometimes and, when you're just saturated in it, you give up hope that there's any other option. Um, so I love what you're doing of really encouraging people to be like, no, we can and do deserve better. And we caught it because when you don't think you could have better, you don't demand better. Right. But when right. you truly believe you could, you'll get out there and demand it. And what we've seen throughout history is when you demand it long enough, it might take a couple decades, but you get it. Um and when you hold that vision tight. So that's really great that you're helping your people hold that in their heads and in their minds and in their hearts. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, if we just look around the world right now, if we look at, you know, Hawaii and Palestine and Turtle Island and uh, even West Papua, all of these places that are currently violently colonized by the U.S. colonial government, or if they're not colonized directly from that government, that government is paying other countries to, you know, for, to commit genocide and horrible violence in those pla in those places toward those indigenous people, and so it, it's a time to to come together, um, all of us, and unite in our struggles and and beyond solidarity, like really see because we are so much more powerful together. We are so much more powerful together, or um, and it, and I feel like you know with the the eruption with Pele awakening uh, in Hawaii right now with, you know, the world talking about Palestine at the World Cup with everything happening. Uh, everybody's waking up. Everybody's waking up. Um, this is starting to feel like a, a, a rise of, some, of, of indigenous magic, you know, of resistance. It's interesting to see all these things happening around us and uh, and to talk to each other, like to talk to you know, Manyetlu or, or or brothers and sisters and siblings and in those lands and be united and see each other and it's and, and be here and talking with you too. It's it's all part of it's all part of that movement and that work and um just strengthening like the, the fibers, uh strengthening, nurturing our connections to each other so that we can help each other in our struggles. But mm -hmm. yeah. That was a bit of a tangent there. No, I like that's the most beautiful tangent ever. Please feel free to do more. <laughs> but no, thank you for educating myself and the listeners of the depth and the breadth of the destructive behavior of the U.S. in Guahan, what we now call Guam, right? This beautiful island, but as your people have known it for millennia, Guahan, you know, um, because I think the vast majority of us here on Turtle Island, quote unquote, mainland, we are, even as indigenous peoples, we are miseducated about what Guam, what Guahan is, you know, and I'm just forever grateful for 
meeting the few tomorrow people I have because every single one of you are fantastic, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know, it's just, you must be something in the blood or I don't know, but you're all beautiful and amazing and creative. And I've just been honored to meet some of your people. And it's also a great honor to provide Nahija as one more small outlet for the gorgeousness of, of your people, the, the horror of the truth that needs to be told and also to amplify contemporary issues, which I think you're about to get into about the water. Yeah, as I was mentioning, you know, this firing range is a tremendous threat to our aquifer. And on top of that, um, you know, the, the military already extracts millions of gallons of water a day from that aquifer, and as well as controls another freshwater resource located at the south of Guam. They were trying to sell it back to us. Uh, at four or five times the cost, and our government couldn't afford it. So we have to rely even more now on our sole source aquifer for the whole island. And when they finish building that marine base, they're going to extract another million gallons of water a day. So an additional, you know, 365 million gallons of water the military will be taking from our aquifer, in addition to everything they're exploiting from us for, for fresh water. Um also, the firing range is located over land that families have been fighting for the return of four more generations now. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service currently occupies that land. And for a lot of us, it's one of the only areas that we can go to to connect directly with our ancestors. There are sacred caves there with pictographs, celestial phenomena, and handprints. So beautiful, um, you know, that are thousands of years old. And there are, there are many, many remains there. Um, even in the caves, you can see some teeth and bone, stories of a couple buried together in one of the caves as well. I think, you know, to imagine a firing range closing off this sacred area to us, you know, a very vulnerable, special place, but then also having all that violence there right in that area, it's um, it's devastating to imagine. Um our, our fruit bat uh, has almost disappeared from our island. And this was a, actually an important na- ancient food source. But more than that, they're just so beautiful to see in the wild. And you can see them in some of the northern islands. But um, there was a huge storm in the northern islands. And, uh, and several finny here, fruit bat, came here to uh, try to find food and to rest. And um, many died from exhaustion. But the first place they go is that northern end of Guam, Latexan, Retidian. That's where they go first to rest and recharge before they go to other parts of the island. They don't stay there. And so again, thinking of this firing range, it's going to impact the survival of all these important species. That's also such a vital fishing area. So many of our fisher folk go there. And what's going to happen is a surface danger zone is going to extend almost three miles out into the ocean. So they're going to have to go out three miles farther from the area that they like to fish in to go to the other side. It's dangerous. It's costly. And they're basically skipping right through some of the richest fishing areas. There was a world record, uh, a Chamorro fisherman had, uh, Gregorio Paris had caught a Guinness book marlin one year and he caught it in those waters (laughs) And those that's where they, they are going to have the surface danger zone. And just a little further from that, the Air Force has applied to for a permit for open burning and open detonation. They've been doing open detonation in the same spot now for 40 years, but they hadn't done open burning for the last 20 years. And so they want to bring back open burning. And our group has been really involved in trying to to stop this because, you know, the Air Force, they violated their own federal policies, federal law in, you know, their permit application. So we took them to court. We tried to sue them. Of course, they filed a motion to dismiss. The judge ruled in their favor. We filed an appeal, but we're taking many, many other strategies other than this uh, one strategy to try to stop this permit from happening because, um, again, it's near a very vital fishing ground. It's near the aquifer. And this is of particular importance to me because this is happening in very close to the land that was taken from my family after the war. Like I said, my my family lost a lot of land after the war and um, mm-hmm. my eminent domain. And my my great grandfather had a copra farm or a coconut ranch where, you know, that's where they were processing coconut meat for fuel at that time before the war. It was the, the only import, export out of Guam. Actually, it was a huge cash crop for Micronesia. And 
my great grandfather had that and he had some pigs he had ranched. And um, so that area, which he also fled to for safety when Japanese forces invaded here and, and he hid with his family for a while before the, the Japanese forces discovered them, uh, relying on that land for food and fish and water. That land was taken from us after, right after the war, you know, the, by eminent domain. And it's very close to that land where they are doing this open burning and open detonation. And of course, we dream of the return of that land one day, but if it's heavily contaminated, um, there's not much hope for that. And so um, it, it's also a personal issue for me, but but it's an issue that impacts all of us because it impacts our health, our safety. Um, if you look at open burning and open detonation, there's no control of it at all. It's it's a horrible, outdated, violent, disgusting practice. You know, they they just literally put bombs out on the sand by the shore and blow them up. The huge plumes of smoke go up over the over the whole cliffside on top of the plateau. You can see these particles just traveling for miles. And um, then also out over the ocean, you know, um, right into that coral reef, again, where lots of people go fishing. Um, mm -hmm. It's located next to two of our most populated villages, it, schools, mm. beaches, churches, you know, it's it's not, it, it's going to impact our aquifer as well. So these two things, the yeah. fire and range complex and the, and the marine base and the air force base and the, and the OBOD or the open burn open nation. This is literally like the whole Northern end mm -hmm. of the Island. It's almost like uh they're, it's, they're trying to make it a, some kind of sacrifice zone. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, we've been, we've been working really hard to, you know, not just um, speak to local government or federal government or military folks, but also to our own people, because we also, have a heavily colonized education system here, you know, mm -hmm. our culture and our and language has suffered. We've got a lot of amazing practitioners who are revitalizing quite a few practices in the language, but um, because of the forced removal from our lands, that there's an erasure there that is so devastating that when people don't see a place that's closed off by the military, or go to Latexin, or if they don't see these places, if they don't engage in these places, they're erased. And then right. we've also there's also this this process of like people becoming desensitized and thinking, oh well, the military is always going to do that, and they're you know they've always done that to us, they're going to just keep doing it. And so right. it's just how it is. And it, so it is. It we do have a lot to do to bring our folks to this moment, to this movement, and um, um, and and of course the key thing to any of this is our is our is our decolonization mm -hmm. and so there's a there is a very uh robust movement now to really talk about decolonization with our folks and also to tap into even non-indigenous folks who call Guam home because we do have quite a few settlers here you know who fee who see us as just this extension of the United States of America so right they you know, they have their own American dream, right? And they think that this is where they're going to realize that, but they're in a, an occupied indigenous homeland. Right. And so we've got a lot of work to do to to get everybody together. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we have a lot of wonderful non-indigenous family members and allies as well right. who are, are standing right next to us at all of these, at all of these struggles, with all of these struggles, Um and, and it's just how do we grow that? How do we how do we share the knowledge, share the information and 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 activate our folks, um, get them to that point where they're going to take action. And we got to meet folks where they're at so that whether that's, you know, mm. they're comfortable sharing stuff on their social media or they can write a letter or they'll stand with us at a protest um, where, wherever they're at. We we want to we we also realize we need to do more of that work because not everybody, because of our colonial history, not everyone's going to feel um, empowered or prepared to critique this massive institution. Mm -hmm. This, yeah, you know, that's so powerful. And, and also we, you know, we're a poor community. So the mm -hmm. biggest economic factors, of course, are tourism and militarism and those are very connected exploitive extractive industries that 
unfortunately, a lot of people, you know, feel like they need to depend on that for, you know, or leave. And mm-hmm. so it, it's been, it's been, it's been hard to, it complicates the work. It, it, it definitely provides a lot more challenges. I mean, yesterday there was a public hearing at the Guam legislature, um, Senator Sabina Perez, who was one of the founding members of, of Prate, La Tugs and Saver City, and who stepped away when um, she became senator. Um, mm-hmm. She introduced a bill to try to ban open burning here, and there was a white businessman who is extremely problematic who came to the hearing to testify against the bill. He was the only one to testify against the bill, um, saying how we were going to harm the other islands in Micronesia who need to bring hazardous waste here if we ban oh the my God. hazardous waste. And it's like, well, who brought the hazardous waste there in the first place? It's not that <sighs> islands. It's not us. We did we didn't put a, you know, we didn't put all this hazardous waste here. And um it, it was obvious he was there because he was worried he was gonna lose some money. Yeah. And uh pretty weak argument too. Yeah. <laughs> if that's who they sent, yeah. they're not they're not very good players on their team. <laughs> um so it's a lot of um it's, it's just, we just have a lot to do, a lot of work to do. Colonization is so, it's it's everywhere. <laughs> it's just everywhere. Yeah. We're in I, I could yeah. imagine being from an island nation as well, indigenous nation. It's isolating, you know, like when when militarization is on your island, it's it's so pervasive. Whereas in Diné, Bakea, you know, we have our own militarization and extractive industries, but you can kind of, you know, merge into the next region and kind of feel away from it. But in Guahanas, that's not really an option. You know, you're like, you're just in it. And I can only imagine the amount of suffering that the people had to go through. And that's, and everything you're saying is not uh, to say yet we haven't mentioned about the brutality of the people, you know, in the past, I know that Dakota has talked to me about the concentration camps that your people were put in, which my people were put in as well here in outside of Albuquerque, um, New Mexico. And just, you know, what that does to a soul, you know, to have your people systematically abused in these concentration camps, to have the women systematically exploited in these concentration camps, like what that does to your soul as you're trying, and then it's like, okay, now fight all these 15 different battles at once. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible. Um, and I just want to say that I'm praying for you. And I know all the listeners who are listening are praying for you because we want to support you in this David and Goliath situation, which, you know, David won in the end, uh, cause he had, you know, righteousness on his side. So, um, I believe in y'all. We're praying for y'all. I'm I'm even crying right now for y'all because it's just a lot, you know, and just know that we stand beside you. Um, and, you know, this is a solutions podcast, supposedly. We talk about solutions. So one of my questions is, what do you feel is the most effective solution you and your people have created or solutions, if you want to talk about a few, uh, to address these issues? You know, uh, what are the... What are the things that work the most? Um, however you want to answer that. Okay. Thank thank you. And thank you for, you know, uh for for your words because um we are we are isolated and that's because we are so far away. That's that's part of the that's part of how empire works, right? The, even that language that we're so small, we're so far away. It's uh, that's also used against us to make us even small, more invisible <laughs> to the rest of the world. And 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 you're right, like there, there, the world, the you know, world media, world governments are so powerful in that erasure. We experience erasure all the time. We're our struggle isn't as no, well known in the rest of the world as other indigenous struggles are. And some people just think, oh, those, well, they're they're a colony of their territory, U.S. territory. It's different. Uh, it. it so I really appreciate you giving us this space to help elevate, you know, our, our voices and our stories and our struggles. And that's definitely one solution is uh, trying to find spaces for each other to, um, to help build each other up and elevate our, our struggles. And uh, when we, when, one way we've done that here at home, our groups have organized several demonstrations, you know, which have helped 
our community come out, find a, a way to to um, engage in the issue, to 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 say something, to feel like they're participating in the fight. Um, we've also worked with elders to organize several ceremonies when burials have been desecrated. And this is something we have not had the capacity to organize as many ceremonies that we need to, to address all of that desecration. But in those ceremonies, we are able to come together in prayer to really honor uh, our ancestors in a way that also heals us from this ongoing violence and trauma. I mean, gosh, you mentioned World War II. That's such a recent time in our history, the, the Japanese occupation during World War II and then the, the U.S. recapture, both of which had camps. <laughs> and, um, you know, but I mean, my grandparents did experience and everybody, so many people, every family had forced either forced march, forced internment, forced labor. There was gendered violence to women and children by both the Japanese occupying forces and the American, you know, reca recapturing forces. I mean, reoccupiers, I, you can even say. People call that when, you know, that day when the U.S. forces came here, Liberation Day, but a lot of us also call it Reoccupation Day. Liberation Day. That yeah. sounds like something America would call something. That is it. <laughs> that has nothing to do with liberation. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that experience, my the stories of my grandfather, you know, my gra and my grandmother fleeing to ranches for safety, then having to do all kinds of work, watching people be murdered, that kind of violence, that evil is something you don't, you can't unsee. And it lives in you and it, it manifests in so many different ways, you know, in our people still. And then, of course, the forced removal from your land. That's just one of the most violent things you could ever experience. And so all of that together still, we carry all of that grief. And so it, 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 uh, I just appreciate you bringing that up. But anyway, back to the solutions, because it can be over overwhelming, right? We're carrying so much grief all the time. One day, my, my grandma said to me, she was like, uh, why, do you, why do you do that? Why do you stand on the road? like that the military is not going to listen to you they never listen <laughs> and I said oh, grandma that doesn't mean we stop you know we can't stop fighting and in fact we have to get the next generation ready so we really need to find hope it's the youth the youth are where you know a lot of us are looking and we always look to our elders but the young folks are bringing this amazing energy and love real love for our land and our people that, you know, can be kind of stomped out of you, you know, from everyday life. And our last two protests were mostly high school and college students um, who are outside with us for hours in the sun, in the rain, monsoon rain, singing, dancing, chanting. Uh, Dakota led a lot of chants, actually, and, and sang for us and um, building those spaces, nurturing those spaces and bringing more people in because uh, I can see the younger generations coming in. One of the solutions is also censoring joy, censoring art. And I got to say, um, Independent Guahan has been great at this, uh, doing several free community concerts and even during the pandemic free television so people could see it on TV and on YouTube for free. And um, having these spaces to really celebrate who we are, um, our survival even, like that we're still here, we're resilient and we're beautiful. We're, we're, we're fucking beautiful. You know, it's like, it's, um, yeah, those you things, are. we don't have enough, <laughs> we don't have enough spaces like that, you know, here and, and so those are th those spaces. Anytime there's um, an event centered on indigenous creation, indigenous art, that's a way to bring people together. But you know, in terms of actually finding um, uh, other solutions, like we, uh, my friend Jessica Nangouts and several others are really farmers, and they're studying traditional medicine and healing, and they're um, trying to help revitalize these practices as well. And so um, my friend Arcella Herrera is another another one who's, you know, there's just so many young women who are also helping this movement um, by just learning and sharing that knowledge. 
but also um, in its connection to food sovereignty as well and trying to bring back indigenous food ways, eating more, you know, fish and local fruit and vegetables that, you know, our elders ate before um, we were just dominated by commercialized food from colonization. It's it's actually really, mm-hmm. really bad. All the supermarkets here and mm-hmm. a lot of fast food, a lot of fast food. The diabetes vegetables. that comes with it. Going back to our food waste is, is another thing that we're that I'm seeing our community focus on and work on. But um, I feel like other solutions that are needed that we really should probably start looking at. I mean, we need to start looking at right away. Are housing, housing has become because of the militarization of the Guahan, the cost of living has gone up, but also all of the housing costs because there's um you know the the military get an overseas housing allowance when they come here so all of these landlords w- want to go for that that makes all the rent higher oh than oh my god are you serious hawaii like hawaii it's really like oh. i rent an apartment because you know um i i wasn't able to get some land from some family like some tomorrow's do they get land from their parents or you know land that's been in their family from for a while some some folks don't have that though they lost a lot of land after world war ii or they had a smaller parcel to pass down so and of course now mm-hmm. land is different it used to be a communal shared shared thing you know yeah. but that's become commodified in in a, in a very destructive way and it's tearing it's actually tearing families apart as well mm-hmm. when Land is just, you know, distributed in certain ways. But anyway, that's when law, that's when law doesn't always work. You know, how the laws of how land is shared and transferred and all that. But anyhow, um, one solution we do need to look at is, is, is a solution for our housing issue here and trying to think of ways to go back to how we live in these collective ways that were more sustainable, uh, where we cared for each other, where, um, communities were safer too because yeah. uh yeah so that's an well let me bit. just let me just get this straight real quick all of the military personnel which how many are there 10,000 20,000 30,000 uh gosh i think there's there's about 20,000 now let's and... say there's 20,000 they all get a allowance yeah from the government to to pay their rent for them right and so they can afford I'm sure the government gives them enough to like get a decent place. So they're essentially buying out all of the rentals in Guahan. Wow. That is, that is like a very bizarre um, way to colonize and occupy and settle an indigenous homeland. That's masked as like just real estate. We're just doing normal real estate. We're just doing normal landlord rental. It's like, no, this is, the same as any other form of uh, co- settler colonialism that was happening in the 1700s or 1800s anywhere else. It's just has a different face. And it's just, yeah, that's that's insane to well, me. Oi is a really good example of that as well. I mean, it's it's like a million dollars a house, you know, uh, for an average house. And, um, you know, I think definitely here in Guam it's 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 impacted the cost of housing and and then also if you look at look at what has, what's happening in Mexico City now too i mean it is it, and that's not military that's just white people uh, going there you know uh sorry well, <laughs> cuz they can afford it let's they can yeah. afford it it's and it's, dri- it it's driving yeah. it's dri- you know it's driving all the rent up and you're seeing the, the people who make the place so special and so beautiful, the people of that place, they can't afford it anymore. The people of this place, you know? And so here, a lot of people leave. Um, a lot of people leave. It is hard to live here. It's, it's, it is, it's, it's challenging to live here. Um, you really get, have to have a very special love, <laughs> deep mm. love um, for this place. I mean, it's, mm. <clears throat> I, I I can't see myself really living anywhere else um, in the world. I, <clears throat> I I can't, and I and I actually wouldn't feel right myself about occupying another person's homeland. Uh, you know, um, unless it was very intentional or there was purpose or right. Yeah, right. yeah, totally. Right. Um, wow. I mean, so okay. Let's recap your solutions, which I loved all of them. Uh, the 
being there for the youth and just being around the youth, right? Um, centering joy, which I love, you know, like, wow, that one's like making me tear up again. Centering joy as a solution. Because, you know, like as Dene people, we have so much amazing awesomeness and there's all kinds of cool events. And it's like, well, what are we really doing with these events? Are we changing the world? And it's like, yeah, you are because you're celebrating, like you said, your resilience and how beautiful we are. Um, and that does so much just to keep us going as people who are fighting really intense battles and also to show our children like, hey, we're awesome. We love ourselves. Um, and um, yeah, your third solution, if I'm not mistaken, being a solution that's pending <laughs> of like housing and making sure that's uh, available to people. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, 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 it's something I would love to see. Um, there's still issues too of transphobia and homophobia. I would say it's inter it's, um, it's internalized from colonization as well. Um, I, I really wish that, uh, we could just say that, um, you know, our Chamorro values are so strong that, homophobia doesn't exist in our indigenous community, transphobia doesn't exist in our indigenous community, but unfortunately it, it does. And, and also in other communities who call Guam home who are, you know, and so there are young, even queer folks, um, even queer communities that need this housing too. And I just imagine like this beautiful place that, you know, people, if people need, need to, need to, you know, to, to live a, sh a shared space, a safe shared space for people to live. I mean, I, it's a dream. It's a dream <laughs> I have that maybe, you know, we can have a big, big lot of land and a bunch of little homes on them and people can come and, you know, I don't know. A dream that's not too far out of reach, I assure you. And, <laughs> and, and, and to, to that point, you know, I think one of the solutions you mentioned was imagination, visioning, um, seeing, um, uh, demanding that this is possible, you know, and I think just like with your idea for the land and the tiny houses and, or whatever kind of houses they are, um, it, that that's something that I see you even just in a short call, just helping me remember that this is part of our solution as indigenous people, as anyone really to envision what, what would you, what would the world look like if we could actually have the world we wanted uh, and not being afraid to dream about that, not being afraid to envision that, because once you have that vision, um, what I found is uh, the universe can kind of rally behind that and help you create it. But it but it needs someone to hold it in their head first. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't interrupt. <laughs> oh, no. So, going into um, this fourth question, I have. Uh, Actually, I guess at this point it's the third. Or yeah, because I because we kind of squished the first and the second. Okay. Yeah. So 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 now going into the uh next question I have, you know, when I read your bio, it said, you know, you're an artist, an organizer. Um, you know, I'm curious what kind of art you do, you know, and I'm just wondering on a personal level, you know, maybe if you want to share more about what what drives you to show up to these fights over and over what drives you to make the art that you make, you know, if there's anything you want to share just from your heart, you know, you've spoken a lot about the territory of the landscape of the battle and what's going on outside of yourself, but, um, you know, what's going on inside of you? What, what brings you there every day? You know, if you feel like sharing. Oh, yeah, thank you. Gosh, I, I just went, my head, my mind just went a lot of, to a lot of directions when you asked that, that question. Um, it, and it, and I, and it's, I definitely imagining a better future is, is one of, is one of those things. Imagining, you know, thinking of all the possibilities for our people and our island, but also imagining who we are in the past is so powerful. And, um, you know, uh, learning from our elder stories as much as possible. Those are the things that I feel help help drive me, but it's it they nurture this very deep love. I can't explain it. I I feel like there's so many of us tomorrow people who are like, 
I bet I love this place more than anybody. I bet I love my people more than anybody, you know? Like, nobody loves Gohan and Shimon people as much as I do. Nobody loves the as much as I do. There's a lot of us who really believe that about ourselves. And I think it's 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 phenomenal and it's it's really cool. But um it is this this big love. I can't, I can't, um, I can't describe it. I mean, I I can't, I I I think none of we all kind of can get get a sense of what what we're what I'm about to say and what I'm talking about. A lot of indigenous, a lot of you know, a lot of us folks probably feel this way, like that. This, this, we feel this land in our veins. This is, you know, we're carrying, we're carrying all of the stories of our ancestors with us and all of the, these hopes and dreams for all the future generations. And it's this huge love. It's this, it's this big love. It's almost like we all know it, but it's also so, <laughs> it's also so big that it's so hard to define. So I think that that's one of the things, but um, I just, it, it triggered a memory. Your question just now triggered a memory of when I was a little kid, um, so uh, Robert Underwood wrote this. He's a he's this amazing Chamorro intellectual and historian and educator and and leader, and he wrote this Chamorro pageant or play um, that some folks um, produced and presented in the seventies and eighties, and it became like this it, part of the huge cultural dance revitalization movement. My parents took me to see it. It was a uh, it was actually done at like my school auditorium when I was a little kid. And there's this beautiful scene in the beginning of how the ancient Chamorros, you know, were living. And there's these Chamorros playing our ancestors on this stage. And it was so cool because it, I was maybe only five and I and it was it made it so like it's not part of a distant past that doesn't exist anymore. This is who we are. This is this is us. And then it depicted the Spanish coming here and the violent missionization and, and murder of all these Chamorro people, this destruction of this beautiful life. and. I mean, it was, you know, it, I, I looked up at my mom and dad and they're both crying. They're both cr crying and I'm crying and I'm just a little kid. And I remember saying, why did they do that? Why did they do that to us? And, you know, just that imagination, just being able to imagine who we were before colonization, but, but also who we still are, acknowledging and seeing who we still are. Like that's not, you know, it's not to be romanticized. It's not to be objectified. It's alive. It's inside of us. And we, that's, it's who we are. So, so that, I think that that's very powerful, but also where we want to go, the possibility, possibilities of that. Like I think indigenous futurisms too is something that that our folks need to see more of. I'm seeing it a lot, you know, it come, coming out. But that, I mean, seeing that and seeing how mm -hmm. it's part of undoing colonization mm -hmm. because somebody, people thought of colonizing. Somebody came up with all that crap. It, somebody, <laughs> put, somebody came up here and put all this fake crap up. We could take it all down. We could <laughs> yeah. take it all down. And it just takes that imagination. And so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> just as many as much as you know as many of those conversations we can have we we need to have them but um I so that's that's it it's just like all that just daydreaming imagining reimagining um better a better reality for us and then it's not a fantasy it's not it's not science fiction it can <laughs> it can happen and um yeah yeah and 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 all that let's see love because some days it is hard. Some days it is hard. You know, I, I, uh, mm -hmm. it, erasure is constant. It's, it happens also. Anytime we have a powerful story in local news about our groups, our communities resisting militarization, resisting all this violence and contamination, then there's an article about threats, missile threats from China, all this I'm, it's propaganda. It's propaganda to make us feel powerless and scared. And then people will say, oh, well, then this is why we need the military here, actually. And this is why the military needs more land. And this is why the military gets to take and destroy more. No, guys, <laughs> we can't. So that's, but that's, it, that's constant. That's constant. And again, like, because we are Guam so far away and, you know, all, this whole area, like, uh, it's not just Guahan and the Medianas. I mean, even the situation in the Marshall Islands, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it, needs to, it needs to be better uh, shared in, right. in uh, yeah, but the rest of the world. I mean, it, it, some, and people are like, oh, it's just a small island. It's like, no, 
all of our indigenous stories talk about how you never discount the smallest thing, you know, and I won't say all of them, but I've noticed a lot of the native stories that I've heard of, like Sky Woman story, the Yahoo story from the Pacific Northwest relatives. It's always like the smallest child comes up with the solution or the smallest bird makes it to the stars or the smallest muskrat is the one who gets the, like, I love how our ancestors were like, no, there's no such thing as big and small, you know, everything matters. And, you know, Guahan is obviously a very special place or else, you know, what we call coyote wouldn't be attacking it so bad, you know, because coyote always goes for the places that are linchpins, that are, that are, prime targets, right? And so like, I know Guahan is special because because of how much it's been attacked. And so I think that, you know, that, that, that narrative of like, it's just a small island is like such the fallacy of colonial culture that they think these small things don't matter. <laughs> and then like later on, they destroy that small thing and it creates this huge cascade of effects. Um, everything from like bees, you know, to like on and on and on. And so, you know, I just think there's no such thing as like just a small place. Like every place is so, every place has purpose, you know, creator doesn't make places for no reason. You know, they all have purpose for a, on a global scale. Yeah. And, and I also feel like looking at the ocean peoples, right. Looking at ocean peoples, uh, People think of, of islands as isolated and small and tiny, and but like we are, we are a di- we are diverse people spread out over an entire ocean who have had connections and relations, uh, and shared histories for thousands and thousands of years. It's like it's actually not super small. And then also when you think about like when I think about all the creation stories of this place of these places. Some of them are stories of settlement, you know, or stories of like um, the fir- the first navigators to go to the islands, right? But some of them are stories of creation, and we actually have one of those stories, and that also shows sort of our age, right? Our age of living and existing in this part of the world, and so our creation story it's so different. Instead of a man and a wife, it's a brother and a sister who co-create. There, it's not a romantic relationship; it's a familial one. And he, he, they're both these ancestors who are really beyond our understanding. They're not human. They're other, they're, they're great spirits, great beings. And he has to go to the next realm. He's dying. And so she takes his body and she makes, she makes the universe. His eyes become the sun and the moon, his eyebrows, the rainbows, wow. back the land, you know, wow. and so on. And, um, and then she turns her body into a rock and when she's ready to die and the rock breaks open and the first peoples come out and we go into canoes and we go around the world. And so mm-hmm. there is a rock here that we attribute to, to our, to this oldest ancestor and right. we visit her and, and it's, um, so that's another thing about these tiny places. They might be tiny to a colonizer. They might be tiny to empire, but they are, like you said, they're so valuable. Why would empire want them? Uh, but whole worlds, whole universes have been created in these, some of these tiny places, really. The, yeah. the magic and the power of the marshals, of Palau, of, you know, the Federated States, um, um, Kiribati, uh, you know, even if we go out uh, past Micronesia to, you know, Solomons and ev- everywhere, everywhere, mm-hmm. you know, on and on. I mean, it's just all of these amazing stories, all of all of these amazing, all, all of this incredible knowledge. And again, it's just, it's something so small can be, is also so infinite, <laughs> I guess is. Right. Is the, all that so uh yeah so I, I appreciate you you have pre- I love those stories you shared um yeah, yeah. they're yeah. totally not even my stories I'm just plagiarizing all the awesome other native nations of the this area um but yeah no well so thank you so so love motivates you anything else you want to share on this question about like what drives you to show up what drive what drives you well I think I think you know so 
what drives me. So it's a love. It's a definitely love of my family, my own family's story of struggle of their experiences during the war. My grandparents, uh, my great grandparents, um, knowing, getting to know who they were, but all the ancestors, all my ancestors, but the, but also, and also all the youth. I mentioned all this earlier, but another thing that really drives me is I remember as a young person feeling like I knew I was tomorrow first before anything, but also at the same time, a lot of people tell us that tomorrow is so eroded, so colonized. It doesn't really, we don't really exist. We've been told this so many times by white educators, settlers, um, oh, media, all kinds of, yeah. So something that really gets me. And then of course, in 2016, we had the Festival of Pacific Arts here. And we had all these Pacific nations come here sharing their culture and their songs and their arts. Wow. And it was just like, some of that was coming up for some people feeling like, oh, we not are enough. colonized. Yeah, we're not enough. We've lost so much. Who are we? Look at all these people. They have so many things intact. They have so many of their their knowledge and their language and their practices intact. It was a lot of grief coming up for a lot of us. Mm. And so, you know, that's 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 one of the things that drives me is is the fight against our own erasure mm-hmm. um, and that feeling that we're not enough because we are not complete. <laughs> that's just it's internalized racism and colonization that we need to 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 address. And it, but it's a very deep wound. So that's one of the things that drives me is you know it's it's a it's still a narrative too that's used against us anytime we we fight any of these issues that oh you know those are sparse remains of your ancestors <laughs> those are scattered remains those are scattered archaeological uh, findings you know things like that it's it's to make us feel less significant or that place is was not occupied by any Chamorros for for many 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 years now you know things like that um, so constantly pushing back against that narrative constantly pushing back against our own erasure is something that personally drives me I gosh I, I was going to take it to another point because. It's just this feeling like, uh, you know, and it be, I mean, and I feel I know a lot of Native people can identify with this going, being told that you don't you don't exist in your, you know, even though you're in your own ancestral homeland. It's something, you know, that has unfortunately inter- been internalized by by some of our own folks as well, you know. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And so this idea of of you know, what a happy life is and what a comfortable life looks like is also has also been shifted unfortunately to like to capitalism you know Mm -hmm. yeah so anyway I what drives me is pushing against all that pushing Mm -hmm. against all that um you know finding finding that community that's creating those spaces helping to nurture those spaces within that community helping bring resources helping and and also creating together what you know whether it's art or song or space and um then that way we just get to to like love on each other too. Like, all right, look at you. You're, you're just the best, <laughs> you know, we got <laughs> yeah. we to we do that more. Um, those are the things that drive me. Uh, I guess my own family trauma <laughs> and yeah. um, it's tremendous love. And then again, this, 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 this uh, urgency, I guess I have mm-hmm. I guess, to combat that erasure, which is constant push back against the narrative that we are, we are small and powerless and, mm-hmm. and, not enough. And another thing that drives me, you know, I, it's, I have not been actually been able to create as much artwork. Yeah. A lot of time is, is to the, to the organizing and the movement and other community work. And so I, I, and I love it. I love it. It's hard to put anything down. It's like, once you, it's like, you can't unsee it. You got to keep going. Mm-hmm. You know? And uh, But I, I also get I also think about like, if we didn't have to do that, if we right. didn't have to work so hard and put all our resources into this fight, we could do so much. We could mm. do so much more with our creativity, yeah. with our energy, with our time. And in fact, it was just a couple of weeks ago, I got so upset. I said that I started crying and I was like, I shouldn't be doing this work. I should be growing. I should be outside in the sun growing food. You know? <laughs> I, should be I should be, you know, I should be. Yeah. So that's. And balancing that, right? Yeah. Because just as we're fighting for our descendants that we haven't met yet to have a life, our ancestors fought for us to have a life. So we also need to make carve out space for art, for music, for food. And so many times that art and music and food is the same as the struggle 
anyways, yes. you know, and, but yeah, no, I hear you. Yeah. Well, another little side note I wanted to share too, is that this narrative that Chamorro people aren't really here anymore. Sorry. You're mostly all gone. Uh, and, uh, your culture's gone. Um, you know, what they teach in schools or, you know, that that's all, of course, very, um, very targeted and pointed rhetoric that is designed by the colonizer to make our needs irrelevant or to invalidate our needs. Um, and my whole dissertation is all about that pretty much. It's about like, why is it that settler society has completely erased the grandeur of our ancient food systems, the, 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 the breadth, how vast they were, like how indigenous peoples managed and sustained entire grassland ecosystems with routine burning of the grasslands every fall. Like instead they just say, oh, this is terra nullius. It's just wildly awesome like this. Nobody created this. It's just how nature was. Let's put in some wheat fields, you know? Um, so these narratives, you know, as I'm preaching to the choir here, but these narratives are obviously very, uh, very pointed, very distorted, uh, very political, um, to, or, or the other funny narrative I hear is like the dark and bloodied ground theory of Kentucky. You know, Kentucky is this gigantic land base and, ev and for so many decades, what they would teach kids in school is there were no native people here. They would just come here to hunt seasonally and everyone would come here for peace, but nobody lived here. And it's so hilarious. You know, it's like, okay, people lived everywhere else except for in this random Kentucky border. But of course that's on purpose, right? Because if nobody lived there, then you didn't take anyone's land. If nobody lived there, then we don't have to talk about how we actually killed everyone who lived there. So, you know, it's it's just time and time again. And we all know this, that uh, settler society likes to write history uh, in ways that legitimize itself, in ways that uh, erase people. Um, and I'm so excited for the work you're doing because you're basically writing back at them. And you're like, nope, we were here. We are here. Our culture never died. We've always been thriving. And even if you don't have all the dance dances that your neighbors have or whatever it is, you know, you have an incredible library of culture that mm -hmm. is completely miraculous that it exists. You know, the entire policy was extermination, right? That was the goal. And yet there's what, 60, 80,000 Chamorro people still thriving and being awesome. So, um, how, how, like, why would we ever be upset about our current state when our current state is an absolute miracle? And just listening to Dakota, you know, who we keep shouting out, I have to thank him for setting up this interview and also just being an amazing artist and friend, uh, how much he's been able to recover and bring out and learn his language. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's incredible. And it's not just enough it's it's gorgeous and it's a miracle and it's everything we need and it's just a complete falsehood that that <laughs> what these primary school teachers are teaching um so thank you just thank you so much for being here like i think we're all very frankly very privileged and honored to hear the truth telling you've shared the stories you've shared um we're all very privileged to just learn the stories that your parents and grandparents have passed down to you um, we're very privileged to get a glimpse into the, the resilience and the beauty of your people. And I just can't tell you how grateful I am that you've graced this podcast thing, whatever it is, tr uh, transmission of hope and inspiration to the world is maybe a better word. Um, and is there anything else you'd like to say before we close? <clears throat> well, thank you so much for having me, I, and I am also grateful to Dakota for introducing us. And um, Dakota is Dakota is doing a lot of great work um, here at home and also uh, all around. And very grateful for all that work. Grateful that they're home to do to do the do that good work here too. Um, I think some of the things I want to share with folks is you know to please check out 
find who we are on social media. You know, we've got um, independent Guahan who has, you know, all the social media, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, but they also have an amazing podcast called the Fenatsu podcast. You know, people can listen to those podcasts or um, follow independent Guahan. And then I'd also love for people to follow Pertale Tex and Saver Tidian. Um, our Instagram especially has two petitions, uh, one to try to stop the firing range and one um, to try to stop open burn and open detonation. And the one for the firing range actually has over 25,000 signatures right now. So those are great. We, we could keep those going. And, um, and also to, um, I just, I just really want to thank you because, you know, I just think of Indigenous Pacific Islanders who out there in Turtle Island, uh, Chamorros, um, there are some Chamorros too who are who are in certain you know in other in other indigenous homelands who are settling who might not be so engaged uh, with some of these issues and I and I hope that some of them are listening because uh, I would like for some of our Chamorro men Yetlu who are living away from home in you know, other occupied nations and territories to to think about ways that they can engage in those struggles and support those indigenous communities in their struggles and also um, just not not act like a colonizer, you know. Uh, that's kind of painful. That's a painful part of colonization too, is like not only is it happening here in our homeland, but we also play a, a role in, in colonization when we leave sometimes and we need to be real about that and change. And so this is kind of a call out to Chimor, some, some of our Chamorro folks. And then also I want to do a, a lovely, a loving shout out to all of us uh, around who are finding each other, coming together, building community together, learning from each other and, um, and uh, yeah, doing the movement work where we're at. So that's so important. That's, that's so important too. So uh, thank you for, for, Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And yes, I think we've all been, if we're not of a settler society, we've all been duped into becoming complicit with it. Uh, oftentimes, I won't say all, but uh, I think about all the immigrant communities here in what we now call the United States, whether they're from China or from the Philippines, or from Iran, or from countries in Africa, or from anywhere, really, and how we're all tricked to come here for this American dream, but accidentally become completely complicit in the um, destruction and occupation of indigenous homelands. Uh, but I also want to believe that if people were educated, they would uh, be more on our side, quote unquote, uh, and more in solidarity with indigenous peoples, if they understood, hey, look, what you're being complicit with is the exact same force that attacked your lands. And when if you can see how we're all brothers and sisters in this, in this situation, then why don't we all just join hands and throw off the yoke of colonization together? Because um, it's, it's affected all of us. And, and even what we now call white people, right? Like I'm half white um, and coming from Scottish, Scandinavian, maybe other stuff I don't know. Um, we were colonized, you know? <laughs> Scottish people right. had our freaking guts ripped out of our stomachs in the town square by the British lords, you know? It's like, it's insane what they did to us. So none of us, whether we're white or black or indigenous right. or Aboriginal, like... Arab, Russian, Asian, it does not, we are all going to be liberated when we throw off this yoke and when we uh, affirm a different paradigm. So anyways, now I'm on a tangent, but thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you to all the listeners for holding space with us, for being in kinship with us, for being in solidarity with us. And of course, this is all driven by a prayer to just, just be a, a force of healing in the world at this time that obviously needs a lot of love. So Thank you, Nick, so much for your time and have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you. You too.